Zeke Yeager is one of the most intriguing and tragic characters in Attack on Titan, and today we're talking about his entire life story. If you enjoy this type of content, be sure to let me know who else I should talk about in the comments down below. And let's get right into this. From the very early stages of his life, Zeke was taught one thing. Eldians are not wanted in society. They were seen as devils that shouldn't exist, and everyone would be better off if they were never born. Everyone. He was also taught early on that he was different and important. His father Grisha wanted him to lead the Eldian people to freedom, and he hoped Zeke could take down Marley from the inside as a member of the warrior program. Unfortunately, Zeke was not performing well in the warrior application process because he had no drive to succeed on his own. Shortly after, it becomes apparent that Grisha and Dina regularly attend a social dance club, leaving Zeke with his grandparents. This prevents Zeke from seeing his parents most nights, and as a result, he grows closer with his loving grandparents than he does with them. In their home, he learns history from Marley's point of view. This time with his grandparents seems to be the most positive aspect of Zeke's life, as the only way for him to gain approval from his own parents is catering to their restorationist beliefs. After getting inevitably kicked out of the warrior program, he meets Tom Saver. The older man wants to play catch with Zeke, and their relationship quickly develops into a father and son relationship. He arrives home happy, but he is immediately placed under another degree of pressure by Grisha and Dina. He is the only hope for the restorationists. If he fails, they all do. Zeke attends the open training, and it of course does not go well for him. His parents watch this in disbelief, before Grisha unleashes his rage at home. He then has a conversation with Tom about his future as a warrior, and he tells Zeke it's not worth it, admitting the only reason he became a warrior was for research purposes. The duo continue to bond until Zeke is required to clean. As he finishes up, he walks past an office where he hears his parents' operation has been found out. He asks his parents to stop their dangerous acts, and they don't exactly take it well. They lecture him on why fighting for freedom is important for the Eldians, and then Grisha explodes at the mention of Faye. Zeke then tells Tom about his parents, and thanks him for playing catch with him, like his father never did. Tom then suggests that Zeke turns in his parents to save himself and his grandparents. He does, and he is chosen as the next recipient of the Beast Titan for his loyalty. We skip ahead a few years, and it's almost time for Tom to finish his research and pass down his Titan. He then tells Zeke about the Founding Titan's ability to alter the anatomy of all Eldians, and that all Eldians Eldians are connected to the Founding Titan. Zeke has a flashback to the discrimination he suffered, and suggests removing the reproductive capabilities of all Eldians to end their suffering. Tom then explains how he lost his family, and the two begin to form the Euthanasia Plan. Tom then reveals a way to bypass the vow renouncing war, but the Founding Titan must be someone that Zeke trusts. He inherits the beast, and remarks that he will fulfill his father's wishes, implying that he saw Tom as more of a father than Grisha. This makes a lot of sense considering the contrast of how the two characters treated Zeke. A few years later, Zeke ventures to Paradise with Peak after the original warrior squad went MIA for five years. After infiltrating the walls, he and some Marleyan soldiers drug the people of Urkago and turn them into pure titans. They then advance towards the center of the walls. Along the way, he picks up some 3D maneuver gear, which he will later take back to Marley in secrecy. After being unsuccessful in finding the other warriors, he retreats back to the outer wall, and eventually he meets up with Reiner and Berthold after their failure. They fill him in on the current holder of the founder, Aaron, who just so happens to share a last name with Zeke. It also just so happens that their father held the same careers. This makes Zeke think Grisha might have survived the trip to Paradis, and while on the island he started a family to continue his restorationist agenda. The fact that Grisha might have started another family, and might have put another child through the same torture Zeke went through, sends him into a slight spiral. He wants to meet Aaron, and save him from his father. He's informed by Berthold and Reiner that Aaron will eventually return to Shiganshina, because that is the location of his father's basement where the secrets of the outside world lie. Zeke believes recovering the Founding Titan should be the warrior's top priority, but Reiner and Berthold strongly believe that rescuing Annie should come first. Reiner and Zeke have a fight to decide what to do, and Reiner gets rocked as per usual. So it is decided that the trio will wait for Aaron to come to them. Before the battle, Zeke reassures the boys that Annie is most likely safe and in hiding. He senses some dissent from the boys, but after threatening to literally kill them, they come around quite quickly. All three of them are in agreement about one thing though, they don't want anyone else to suffer the lives they have. All three want this to end with them. They cheer 
with some coffee, and Peek alerts them that the scouts are fast approaching. Unfortunately, this will not be the battle the warriors are hoping for. Not long after the scouts arrive, Zeke sees Reiner's transformation. This is his signal to transform and to transform the buried Prue Titans as well. Upon transformation, Zeke launches a boulder at Wall Maria, blocking the gate and effectively preventing the scouts from retreating. He then commands all of the shorter Titans to rush towards the wall, while keeping the taller Titans arched around the exit, further blocking the scouts' escape. On the wall, Erwin commands some scouts to engage with the shorter Titans as they approach the town. The battle wages on for a while before Zeke gets the signal from Reiner to throw Berthold. He does, and Bert transforms shortly after. Zeke then begins launching broken up boulders towards the houses, eviscerating scouts and houses alike. A red mist smothers the battlefield as he continues his pelting. However, he soon notices the scouts charging towards him while firing off smoke signals. He hurls a few more rocks and all of the scouts are killed, except one. That's when Levi makes his approach from the side, and well, Zeke gets thrashed. Just absolutely dissected. As Zeke pops out of his titan, Levi shoves a sword in his mouth. But before he can do anything else, Peek comes to Zeke's rescue, and he orders the remaining pure titans to kill Levi. The duo retreats south through Shiganshina. This is when Zeke meets Eren for the first time. He immediately assumes that Grisha treated Eren the same way Grisha treated him, but he believes his father's brainwashing worked on Eren. However, before they can continue their conversation, Levi appears on the wall. Zeke tells Aaron he will save him someday, and apologizes to Bert for letting him die. They retreat, saving Reiner on the way before departing for the wharf. After the loss at Shiganshina, Marley's strength is drawn into question, and a coalition known as the Mid-Eastern Allies declares war on the nation. Zeke and the warriors are of course called to action. At some point during this war, he saves a woman named Yelena. She would go on to idolize Zeke, and become a devout follower of his for saving her from Marley. Zeke then tells her about the euthanasia plan, and she helps him create a force of volunteers that will assist in the advancement of Paradis. These volunteers do not know the truth about the euthanasia plan. They are instead told that they are helping advance Paradis to get revenge on Marley for the annexation of their homelands. It is unclear whether this idea comes from Zeke or from Yelena. As the war wages, Zeke meets with a representative from Hizuru, who will be a liaison between him and Paradis. During one of these meetings, Zeke shares the ODM gear with her, and together they use modern technology to improve the design design of the gear. While this is going on, volunteers are arriving at the island. The war ends with the Battle of Fort Slava, where Zeke plays a pivotal role, activating kinetic bombardment and destroying the navy protecting the fort. Marley comes out victorious, but the message is clear. The power of the titans is waning. It won't be long before it is obsolete in the face of newer military weapons. After returning to Liberia, there was a meeting between the heads of Marley, including Zeke. They discuss the issue with titans, and Zeke makes a suggestion. He thinks the invasion of Paradis is for the best, as recovering the founding titan would give Marley a huge advantage and allow their military to catch up while the power of the titans is on its way out. The brass considers his idea and ultimately believes it is the best course of action. At some point in time in Liberio, he meets with Aaron who is in disguise. They discuss the euthanasia plan and Aaron agrees that it's a good idea, because the only way to prevent the suffering of Eldians is to make sure they are never born in the first place. Hearing this brings Zeke to tears. He's obviously ecstatic that he finally has blood family that sees things the same way he does. He tosses Aaron a base fall as symbolism of a handshake, but Aaron drops it. He says it's because of his dulled senses, but considering this symbolism, Zeke is caught a bit off guard. They head their separate ways, and it's not long before the stage for Willie's play is built. This play is where Marley will formally declare war on Paradis. As the play begins, things appear to be going smoothly, until Peek, Porco, and Zeke are escorted by a mysterious soldier. Reiner also gets pulled away, but by Falco, who actually brings him to meet with Aaron. The play reaches its conclusion, and Red is War is declared Paradis, Aaron transforms, eating Willy and beginning battle with the Warhammer Titan. Somewhere off screen, Zeke transforms and begins his approach towards the arena. At the same time, the theater area is flooded by members of the Survey Corps, and Peek and Porco also join the fray. Aaron temporarily gets stuck in a tree and transforms once again. With all the shifters in the arena, the battle quickly comes to a standstill. Zeke lets some rocks rip, and then lets slip that Aaron is not his enemy. Peek hears this and looks concerned. Unfortunately, she does not have much time to consider this as Armin transforms in the port. This transformation sets off Porco, and acts as a signal for the scouts to move as well. Zeke is quickly felled by Levi, and his body is smuggled on the airship back to Paradis. After the battle is settled, they have a conversation on the airship. They can't decide if the mission was a success or not, but now Paradis at least has a titan of royal blood and the founder. Once they arrive on Paradis, Zeke is escorted to a forest of giant trees. He is to be guarded by Levi and a ton of other Survey Corps members. They talk, and Levi's animosity is clear. Zeke tells him about the events of Urkago, but adds that under the influence of of his spinal fluid, people cannot move. A few weeks pass and news of Aaron's betrayal reaches Levi. Zeke eavesdrops
eavesdrops on Levi's conversation and learns that he will soon be fed to Titans. He decides this is the best time to make a break for it and meet Aaron. He runs away screaming and all of the scouts except Levi turn into pure Titans. He's convinced that Levi won't kill his own people and he will get away. He is of course wrong and Levi comes after him. He's forced to transform and once again he is quickly disassembled by Levi. Zeke is then barely kept alive to prevent him from transforming again. For hours his limbs are constantly removed and a thunder spear has been stuck in his abdomen. It gives him time to reflect as rain dusts his face. He thinks about what Tom would want him to do and so he pulls the thunder spear. It sends him and Levi flying from the carriage. He is brutally mutilated, but one of the transformed titans appears behind him and stuffs him into its stomach. Zeke then finds himself in a bizarre place, a desert, with a roar borealis overhead. He is approached by a child who begins to build his body out of sand. He questions where he is, and questions what his life has become. A few hours later, Zeke emerges from the titan's corpse, completely healed. At the same time, Flock and some Jaegerists approach him, before escorting him to Shiganshina. We can assume they filled him in on the situation with Marley's invasion on the way over. Zeke transforms again and climbs the wall. He rips chunks of the walls apart, and throws the at Reiner who's currently pinning Aaron down. Zeke's arrival immediately changes the dynamic of the battle, as a one condition for Paradis has appeared. If they can assist Aaron in coming in contact with Zeke, they will win. Zeke contributes to this goal by shredding the airships before taking aim at Peak and then the soldiers of Marley. He makes sure no one can get close to Aaron as he approaches the wall. He revels in the fact that their goal is so close to being completed and notices that Peak has died, or so it seems. In reality, it is Magath's plan for a sneak attack and he lands a shot taking out about a third of Zeke's torso. This causes him to fall off the wall and incapacitates him temporarily. Aaron speeds up his approach, taking care of Porco on the way before he too is incapacitated by Magath and Peek. The struggle continues and soon Zeke awakens. He sees Aaron struggling with Reiner and decides it's time to scream. But right as he draws a deep breath, he's interrupted by Falco and Colt. They beg him to wait until Falco is out of the radius of the scream. Time seems to slow down while Zeke considers what to do. He understands the deep desire to protect one's brother, but he also knows the only way to protect his brother is to scream. And so, he does. He then commands Falco to attack Reiner, and Reiner can't control both him and Eren. As they continue to struggle, Zeke is shot once again, and it seems like he's actually done for this time. Peek and Magath are about to go for another shot on Eren, until Armin destroys the artillery. Zeke's body begins to dissolve, indicating to onlookers that he is most likely dead, but Eren knows he's not. After Reiner punches him in the mouth, he hardens his head and jumps out, running towards Zeke. Unfortunately, FaZe Gabby is standing between him and Zeke, and Eren gets decapitated. Luckily, Zeke catches Aaron's flying head, and he still has a tiny bit of life left within him, so they make contact, and are transported to the paths. They talk for a while as Zeke explains what the paths are and who the founder is. It seems as if Aaron has kept Zeke waiting for years. In that time, he dressed himself in chains and created a test for Aaron to see if he truly believed in the euthanasia plan. He goes on to tell Aaron that only he can control the founding titan, and he begs Aaron to remove the reproductive capabilities of all Eldians. Aaron refuses. He was only playing along to get the founder, but this is exactly what Zeke predicted. He thinks it's because of Grisha's influence, and Zeke then admits that it is the will of those with royal blood that are able to control the founding titan, and he's found a way to nullify the vow renouncing war. He places Eren in chains and tells Eren that he will save him from Grisha's brainwashing, much like how Tom saved him. Using the power of the founder, they take a look down memory lane, watching Eren's life, looking for moments where Grisha influenced him. Zeke's ill will towards Grisha becomes instantaneously obvious, but he's not seeing anything too incriminating besides occasionally meeting with important people. They learn that Grisha found the king's hideout years earlier than originally predicted, but he did not steal the founding titan. Instead, he left to be with his family. Zeke realizes this man is not the same one that raised him. Grisha has undoubtedly changed for the better, and Zeke becomes a bit confused about where Aaron's motives came from, until he sees the cabin incident. This is when he learns about Aaron and Aaron's true beliefs, that Aaron would rather kill someone trying to take away his freedom than let them take his freedom. He sees that Aaron has always been this way, and that the betrayal was set in stone from the very beginning. Aaron criticizes Zeke's hatred for Grisha, as it has been his driving force ever since the man's death. Zeke kind of takes pride in this, as it means his father will be responsible for the death of the nation he tried to save. He tells Aaron he will never abandon him, and they return to the basement where we once again see Grisha reminiscing over his first family. He then leaves, promising to show Aaron the basement and the walls 
fall. We have arrived at that fateful day, the day Grisha stole the founding titan. However, we learn the only reason Grisha ever stole the founding titan was because of Eren's influence. Without Zeke taking them back, none of this would have happened. Zeke is confused and concerned, but he cannot do anything at this point. But watch. Grisha emerges from the chapel and has a breakdown. He apologizes and wishes he could have treated Zeke better before looking up to see Zeke right there. Grisha is grateful to see his son once again. He apologizes and tells Zeke he loves him. He admits to his wrongdoings and understands that all of this is partially his fault. Zeke finally gets the validation he's been looking for for his entire life before being shot back into the paths. The brothers talk about what happened before Zeke orders Ymir to carry out the euthanasia plan. Eren breaks free of his chains, catches up to Ymir, he convinces her to make a choice instead of blindly listening to the royal family, and it works. The rumbling has begun gun and Zeke disappears. A day passes before Zeke is involved again, and the next time we see him he's just building a sandcastle. He's approached by Armin, who has also been eaten by Ymir. Also, not to ruin the mood, but do you think Zeke heard Armin's whole breakdown? You know, the one that happened literally right behind him? Like, this dude was screaming at his body. Meanwhile, Zeke is just building a sandcastle. Anyway, they begin talking. The Zeke we see in this chapter does not feel like the Zeke we knew. It quickly becomes apparent that he does not want to live any longer. His dreams are crushed. He is apathetic and cold. He tells Armin about the origin of life and its purpose to multiply. He also tells Armin why Ymir did what she did and that she chose Eren because she still has attachment to the outside world despite her separation from it. Zeke feels very reflective in this segment of the chapter. With all the time he's had in the paths, it's no wonder that he's questioned what he could have done differently and why he failed in the end. Armin probably doesn't care about this all that much. Instead, he needs to know how he can get out. Zeke does not know if it's possible. He continues to tell Armin that death is natural and that that it could even be considered freedom from the fear that consumes life. It isn't until Armin elaborates on his interpretation of the meaning of life that Zeke starts to come around. Armin believes that precious insignificant aspects of life are what makes life worth living, not the furthering of a species. He pulls a baseball out of the sand, and Zeke looks back on his most fond memories, which are all of him playing catch. These small, insignificant moments bring us satisfaction and enjoyment in our life. Once Zeke sees this, past shifters begin to gather around Zeke and Armin. Zeke thanks Tom for playing catch with him and thanks Grisha as well before requesting help from them. He exits the founding titan and realizes that it is a beautiful day to die. And then, he does. Zeke Yeager is, by most definitions, a failure. He failed to live up to his parents' expectations, he failed to put the euthanasia plan in action, he failed to unbrainwash Eren, and he failed in almost every single fight he was in. His story is designed to be tragic, and I don't know if there's anything more tragic than failing at everything you set out to do. Despite this, he is one of the most influential characters in Attack on Titan. Thank you all for watching. If you made it to the end of this video, please consider subscribing and maybe check out the Patreon as well. I truly appreciate all the support I've gotten so far, and I'll see you next week week for another video.